Next up is Maurice Daly. He's from Ireland. He's an Enterprise Mobility MVP, and he's going to talk about Windows security. Take it away, Maurice. Thanks, Nola. So following on from what Jan just spoke about, um, I suppose the most important thing that we think today of protecting our, ourselves about is protecting identity. But where, where does the majority of logons come from? Um, it's our users, and they're on Windows devices. Every day they're signing in. And I'm going to talk about the, the analogy of that we, we, we're building a house. So we built our house, and it's like our network. Okay, We, we have a computer. So we're going to say our, our house is like our computer. It's, it stores information. It lives in a neighborhood of other computers. Okay, and, and you like living uh, in your neighborhood. You might know that there's John across the road or, or Michael living next door to you, and you might trust some of your neighbors. You might even give them a key so they can mind your house while you're away and things like that. But do we really trust everyone around us? Uh, should we trust everyone around us on our devices? That's what we need to ask ourselves. So with Windows being the cornerstone of um, that initial um, authentication for a lot of companies. Um, how can we deliver security best practice to your Windows devices and therefore protect your users? Well, of course, we can do that through Microsoft 365. Okay, and there's some great benefits for that. So anyone that's been in IT long enough uh, have obviously worked with group policies. The thing about group policy is you can put a bunch of security settings and push it out to devices, and you might check to see if the device is receiving that and does it work okay. But can we report on that? Well, no, the short answer is no. But with Microsoft 365 and delivering policies via Intune, we can. We can see you know, what, what device has a policy applied. Is it successful? Is there a conflict? All of that good stuff. And of course, one of the things that Jan also talked about there was reporting. We need to know what's going on in our environment. You know, having the best alarm system, best CCTV on your house, again, it's only one step. But if you don't know what's going on in your environment, then, then problems could be festering away. And when I talk about this, this kind of build process of you know, building the walls, putting an alarm in, making sure you've got a pin code, that, this kind of stuff, um, I'm, I'm not coming from a, a practical experience of building houses. In fact, these, I, these hands have only ever worked with laptops. But we can use this analogy. So if we, we talk about the four main things I think are important today. Number one, identity and access management. Two, threat protection. OK, that's been around for as long as I can remember. Um, information protection, that's more of a concern, particularly I suppose, in, in the last 10 years. And there's reasons for that. New laws have been introduced and so on. Um, and of course, enterprise security. And if we don't take that first one, identity and threat protection, very seriously, well, then we're kind of into the zone that we end up like this guy on the screen, where this is fine. OK, we're just sitting there blissfully unaware, drinking our coffee. Everything's burning around us. But we know about that one thing that we did really well. Never mind everything else that's burning all around us and could come and cause us problems in the future. So how do we go to start protecting ourselves from these kind of intrusions? And even I, when, when Stola was on earlier on, I didn't even realize that ransomware looked like that. But how do we protect against that puppet that's going to enter our environment? Well, here's one thing I just want to run past you, first of all. And this is a kind of a story. I suppose it, it's been in uh, where I am come from uh, in Ireland. It's been in the press quite a lot. But this is a mineral here. Uh, called pyrite. And some of you might remember it from even your childhood. I know I certainly do. So you might have had something like this that you see on the screen right now, a small little jar full of this stuff. And it kind of looks like gold. Um, and they call it fool's gold. And the thing about pyrite is it's a naturally occurring mat material. But when it gets uh, into contact with uh, water and oxygen, it expands. So you can think about this like what we see here. OK, so if this pyrite is in your material that's going in and building your house, you could be unfortunate where this starts happening to your home. OK, and obviously, 
we're, we're looking at the, the, the kind of Irish press there, we're looking to see this is terrible news that's happened to individuals, and that's more of a personal story. But what I'm trying to say is that this one small little thing might grow over time and cause you a problem. So failure to secure, um, really it's about ensuring you're protecting your organization from the expense of time and money. So lost productivity, uh, potential for data exposure. I mean, who wants your data being shipped out to God knows where so that anyone can consume that? And of course, reputational damage. And that might be far reaching. That could end up in your organization actually having to close down. So what do we want to do? We want to avoid this at all costs. So there are things we can do, um, and features that are in Windows. So we we'll take Credential Guard as a, as a good first step. Uh, Credential Guard is a way of virtualizing your security information so that it can't be harvested and then moved across with lateral movement to a different machine, and eventually maybe obtaining someone else's credentials that gets up to that higher place where all of a sudden we own the entire network. And of course, when we talk about ransomware, in particular, and that's what uh, Stoller was talking about earlier on, um, that lateral movement can have devastating consequences. So you might end up coming into your organization on a Monday morning, having had a great weekend, and you turn on your PC, or it's already on, it's power booted, and it says you have to pay Bitcoin to get your data back. No one ever wants that. Next thing, Jan touched on this as well, uh, Windows Hello. So this is a, a great, uh, biometric security that you can have on your device. Um, so you can use a fingerprint, facial recognition, you can even just use a pin. And a lot of um, people often ask, well, why am I asking um, users now to use a pin instead of a, a, a password, so a complex password? Well, the pin is only specific to that machine. So if you were to give those credentials to say, M Michael, we talked about earlier on, your neighbor, they can get into that machine but they can't get into another machine as you. It's only that machine in that one place. Self-service is a big thing as well, because of course, if inevitably users are going to do something by accident, especially if they're not protected. So we'll take a scenario where there's always one user in, in an environment that I would say, will click on anything that you send them. So they click on an email, it they comes up with a logon screen, they go to logon and they've given away their credentials online. If they realize they've done something wrong, should it be a case that they need to wait for the IT service desk? Maybe it's over a weekend? No, they should be able to log into a self-service portal and remediate that as soon as possible so it just stops their identity being used further. So with threat protection, we are talking about things like uh, AppLocker. And AppLocker is one of those really cool features, I think, in Windows that is underutilized. So we push out software to end users, and in some cases, some, depending on which way they onboard it, might be an administrator of the machine. And that's something we want to mitigate against too, but we want to ensure that we only let them use the applications that we deem appropriate. Okay, so for instance, if they want the, to download something that unzips a file, they can't go onto Google and just type in a quick search, download the first thing, and of course, the first thing is always the best, and then all of a sudden, they're injecting ransomware, which runs under user context onto the device. So AppLocker is a, a great tool to implement. Attack surface reduction rules, also a fantastic thing. And I'll actually do a demonstration a little bit later where we, we talk about something that was going on right here when we were uh, preparing for this. But we've got things like uh, exploit protection, um, application control, and network protection. So we can implement all those things. So for instance, if we receive an email and it tries to generate a child process, that gets stopped. Or if we're trying to do some administrative task, that gets stopped. And we have the threat and vulnerability management dashboard. Okay, and that tells us about things that are going on inside our entire environment so that we get an overall picture about everything that goes on and the remediation actions for that. With information protection, BitLocker has been around now for, for many years, and it's really been, I suppose, Microsoft's success story getting people onto having encrypted devices. So no longer should you have the distinction of, well, this is a desktop and this is a laptop. They're only going to encrypt this stuff here. 
because in some cases desktops might be you know that size and they can be removed and in fact I if they're going to be thrown out maybe the hard drives haven't been wiped in time you know so there's reasons why we want to ensure that all devices are encrypted and of course with every device coming with SSDs, we see no performance uh, degradation on that device. And of course, we're going to restore recovery keys today in the cloud. And the, th the good thing about that is users can obtain them themselves. Again, another self-service win. There is something that we require, which is the threat protection module. And of course, for those of you who know the next version of Windows is coming out, that is also a prerequisite. And we can use a feature called Secure Boot. So that allows us to have a uh, trusted bootloader so that if a, a, a rootkit or something tries to get past the fact that we, are, we have a, a, a vulnerable boot sector, we can prevent that from happening. So the user prevented from booting the machine with malware injected at that very early stage. So in enterprise security, Depending on the way um, you've onboarded your device, as I said earlier on, you might be an admin of the device, and, and that's maybe not something you want to go through. So we can control that in much the same way that we would have done with restricted groups and replacing and updating group membership in group policy. We can do that today in MDM through CSP policies. So for an example, you might want the device admins group and the global admins to be a member of the, the local administrator group on that device, but no one else. So we, we can do that. We can do a replace function or an update. Device compliance. Of course, we want to trust the device. And that, that goes into what Jan was saying about conditional access policies. So if we're able to demonstrate that we have BitLocker enabled, we have a TPM chip, we have an up-to-date antivirus, we get access. If we don't, you're stopped. And depending on what happens then, you know, you can have conditional access rules to push you down a certain path. But here we're, we're focusing actually on the Windows device that the user is using. And of course, Windows updates. With Windows updates, they're doing more than just adding functionality. They're doing security, and we should all know that. But we should also be able to um, have different groups rolled out quite easily. Okay, being able to chop and change a different feature update for you, uh, a different quality update time for you, and having this all reportable in the cloud. And then we come on to the more traditional bits with the antivirus, anti malware side of things. So Defender for Endpoint is one of those products that has really shown what Microsoft can do in this space. And I know a lot of you might have looked at Defender and they said, oh, okay, it doesn't ha seem to have all the bells and whistles that we see in some other products. But it actually does. It's just under the hood. Um, but we can see stuff like timelines. So for instance, if uh, a user gets an email and it has a malicious attachment, we're able to see at what time that payload might have been triggered or it reached out and did something else. And we can see secure score improvements. So over time, we can compare ourselves against other companies in your industry to see how you compare to them and what you can do to further improve security in your environment. And a lot of those are actually fed back through Defender for Endpoint to show you, OK, there's a critical vulnerability in Adobe Reader, for instance, and here's the fix. Or it is a registry setting for this application, and here's the fix. Reporting, of course. Well, I'm going to mention it again, but reporting is critical. So being able to view your entire enterprise health from a single pane of glass, and be, that, that makes you proactive about your environment. So rather than being the reactive firefighting or sitting there drinking your coffee, everything's burning around you, you have more time to be proactive about fixing these issues before they become an earth-shattering event for your organization. So why Microsoft Endpoint Manager? Well, the cloud-first approach has really been driven these past few years, especially during this pandemic. Everyone is now working from home. And if we look back at, say, 2016, how did Microsoft compare against competition back then? Well, they were seen in a bit of a, a niche or a kind of visionary space where they were competing with lots of different other vendors emerging at the time. But if we move on to today, we actually see that Microsoft have made a huge improvement. Okay? They are now considered to be a leader in the enterprise space. 
Um, conditional access has been something that has changed the way people look and access their data. And that's why today, as of 2021, we see that Microsoft is now the leader in this space. So to understand your environment, security applies to everyone. Okay, and that should be a kind of a base level, whether it's your C level, uh, your normal employees, it applies to everyone. Exceptions should be very rare and very specific and should not be applied to someone who say, I don't like the fact I could be prompted for multi-factor. Because if you don't like it, then attacker will like it because they're never gonna be prompted. Settings, how do we apply them? Well, we can start moving away from the group policy model that we're used to and move to MDM. And Microsoft has done some fabulous work there where they've added things like the settings catalog where the, the, the parity of, of group policy is really getting up there and there's more and more settings coming in. And of course, staying current. And that's patch management, like we spoke about earlier on with Windows updates and your update rings. Um, and it's understanding what Intune gives us and what it doesn't give us as well, because we might need to have, say, a third party product in there so that we can patch you know, Google Chrome or Adobe Acrobat or whatever the case may be, other applications that we have. But we need to cater for those. We also need to ensure that um, OEMs are, are part of that because they have particular updates and firmware updates that can be pushed down. And OEMs are starting to have integrations into Intune as well. So on the reporting side of things, we can look and see what we have out of the box okay, to report on s various different things like, okay, let's look at um, attack surface reduction rules. And this is actually one of the things I was just speaking about a little earlier on where during preparing for this, we were, we were doing some testing. And Jan was saying he's bringing up uh, a screen where it kept blocking him uh, on attack surface reduction. Okay, and I'll, I'll go to show you what that looks like in a sec. But here we have the individual components that we can see to, to report on our devices. And they're in the reporting node and also in the monitoring nodes. So that's a, a key thing to point out, that they're not all in reporting. I, I personally would actually love to see them all in a reporting section. Um, but, so, but there's a lot of stuff that, that's in there where we can see, okay, what's our device compliance look like? What does our bit locker encryption look like? And here we're going back to the, the ASR one. So in this instance, what was actually happening is we we're trying to invoke uh, PS exec as uh, an admin. And we can see here then we're getting a lot of block events. So Jan was actually saying, why am I being blocked? It keeps coming saying access denied. So I says, Jan, it's a tax surface reduction. So we went in and lo and behold, of course, there's a setting for PS exec. We turned it to audit mode and then you can see that actually at the, the top of the screen. Device compliance we monitored. So like I said earlier on, you know, is it BitLocker encrypted? Does it have a TPM? Is the antivirus up to date? We can monitor all of that stuff. BitLocker encryption. Okay, yes, we want to see is the device encrypted? We want to see is the TPM on? Is it ready? Um, and if we're ever in a position where we're going to get audited, we need to be able to demonstrate that to uh, the auditors. But what do we need to do if we want to get custom? Well, this is like being the own, your own architect of your own environment now at this stage. So we can build custom work groups, or sorry, workbooks. And that's done through Azure Log uh, Workspace. So here we're looking at a couple of different examples coming on screen where we're doing dashboards that suit your needs, visualizations, grouping, and providing access to others so that they can just go in and get the reports, but they don't need to go anywhere else and say the uh, endpoint manager admin center or anything like that. They can just go and have a look at a board that's tailored for them. And we'll take an example here. This is one for, uh, for AppLocker. So we can see monitored, audited, or blocked apps appearing. So we can say, we're going to push out a policy. How is it going to affect us? Well, we've catered for built-in apps in Windows and program files, and we've catered for some vendors, but I want to know about what is going to stop users from doing their job when we push this out. So we push out a policy, and then we're able to report on that. We have the Windows updates. So again, the, uh, the differential between that is the fact that we see uh, individual KVs, feature updates, and uh, various different aspects based on our own requirements.
And finally, now it's up to you to take everything that you have from what Yana said about identity, what I said about window security, and put it all together. So this is know your foundations and their weaknesses. Address weaknesses with minimal user impact. Control your devices anywhere through MDM policies and build out custom reports. And of course, monitor everything. Thank you very much, Maurice. Thanks, Lola. And uh, your word for our crossword. What is it and why? My word for my crossword, well, it was actually in my last slide. Was it? It was, but I kind of went through it really quickly. Oh, yeah, okay. But uh, it's security. Oh, yeah, security. We already had that all on there, so that's great. Thank you very much.